I will now welcome Kristen Hanshorst, Project Lead of Women's Heart and Brain Health Research at Heart and Stroke. Hello, I want to start by acknowledging the land on which I sit today here in Ottawa. It's the traditional unceded lands of the Algonquin Nation. We're gathered today because of a shared commitment to equity and health equity in particular. So I encourage you to reflect on that and what that means for you in your work and in your lives from coast to coast to coast to wherever you may find yourself as you listen to our speakers today. Equity matters to heart and stroke. In 2016, we embarked on a multi-year initiative to look at and to correct how women have historically been under-researched, under-diagnosed, under-treated, and under-supported in heart disease, stroke, and vascular cognitive impairment fields. This webinar is part of that commitment to addressing those unders, even in these unprecedented times. If you'd like to learn more about our work on women's heart and brain health, I encourage you to check out our content on heartandstroke.ca. And if you'd like to get involved, you can join our Heart and Stroke Women's Heart and Brain Health Research Network. With this commitment in mind, we're bringing this webinar to you today because we know that information on sex and gender differences regarding the risk of developing COVID-19 and the severity of the disease is emerging. This information is generating a lot of questions, a lot of concerns, and so we wanna try to address those. We're hoping that we'll also be able to talk about how it's impacting men and women differently while hearing from three different perspectives those of lived experience, research, and health professionals. We're going to be first and foremost hearing from someone with lived experience with heart disease um, and talking about what it like, looks like to live during this COVID-19 time. We'll hear an overview of emerging data and hear about some current knowledge related to sex and gender differences and disease rates and risk. We'll hear about sex and gender considerations in a clinical context and how this is really shaping up for patients in a healthcare setting. And finally, from all three speakers, we'll hear some practical tips about how to care for yourself, how to care for those you love, and how to um, look at this from a sex and gender perspective. We have a fantastic panel today. Um, I want to acknowledge my co-moderator, Catherine Rand, the Director of Health Promotion and Government Relations in Nova Scotia, and our three presenters. I'll introduce each of them as we get to their individual presentations. So first and foremost, I am pleased to present uh, Nicole Nickerson. Nicole is one of Heart and Stroke's foremost women's campaign supporters and advocates. She's a woman with lived experience, and she lives in Nova Scotia. Nicole, over to you. Thank you, Kristen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like Kristen said, my name is Nicole Nickerson. I am 36 years old. I live in Middle La Haye with my husband and my two young children, aged two and three, and I am a person with uh, lived experience. My heart disease started six years ago uh, when I lost my sister uh, to a heart attack, which was completely unexpected. She was 25 years old. The same year, I went on to have my first heart attack. And then I went on two years later on the anniversary of my sister's death to have my second heart attack while pregnant with my son. Fortunately, um, they were able to do a C-section six days later, and we've been healthy ever since. After that time, I've dedicated myself to advocating for women's heart health and doing everything I can in my power. I'm not perfect, but I try to not have to be a burden on the healthcare system unless I have to be. And today that looks a little bit differently with COVID-19 because now I'm social isolating. I don't go grocery shopping unless I absolutely have to at the very most once a week and um, just really trying to keep myself healthy at the same time while being at home. I do have a lot of concerns. I'm gonna start with those because I feel that that really is the reason we're here today. Mm -hmm. um, my biggest concern right now is probably for my other fellow women's heart health um, people. I know that we're all scared. I know that we're, a lot of us are mothers, 
we're working in essential services. So we're working the front lines every day. We're trying to look after our children, daycares are closed. So we're trying to manage a lot of different things. And I've heard from so many women that they're working at home, they're trying to keep their children at home. And this is just a whole lot of added stress on people. And on top of that, I know it's challenging enough for us to be taken seriously with women's heart health before a pandemic. And I'm wondering what that looks like now as we emerge into the pandemic and it continues. A lot of us are missing our appointments. We have blood work. We have a lot of specialists. Unfortunately, our chronic disease doesn't end because the pandemic is going on. And what I also find very concerning is that we're seeing a lot of reports on Twitter that people aren't presenting to emerges with stroke and heart attacks. And everyone's wondering where are those people? And so I am not a doctor, but I do know that healthcare workers are not going to give you COVID-19 any quicker than they want you to give them COVID-19. So they're going to do everything they can that everybody's safe. And COVID-19 is an emergency, but so is a stroke and heart attack. And you really have to look after yourself. And if there's one thing I've heard a lot in the past two years from women is that they knew something was wrong. We seem to be really in tune with our bodies. So listen to yourselves and go get checked out if you think something is wrong. And the other thing I want to address is the new um, rules and regulations on medications. Um, now, all of a sudden, they can only give it to you for a month, your prescriptions, which I understand, but it's um, creating a lot of problems. And I really have to worry about if women will be able to afford their medications now that you're gonna be paying the copay or the large sum um, in, from three months to one month and also the accessibility that you may have. I personally don't wanna to go to a grocery store if I don't have to, but now instead of going once every two months for my medications, I'm going to be going a lot more often. So in having said that, I'm going to talk about things that I've been doing with my family uh, during COVID-19 and how I've been managing my sentence at home. And my biggest thing is staying in touch with my healthcare team. I have a great team. I'm really lucky around me. And I always kind of keep in check with them and, you know, kind of let them know how I'm doing. I always kind of keep track and see how I'm feeling. Everything's okay. So I'm not really too worried about it. I don't know how long as this progresses, what that's going to look like, if I'm going to need more blood work and how you go around doing that. But oh. I'm sure I will talk to them about that when it comes. And the other thing is to stay on your medications. The other thing, I'm, you read a lot of things on the internet and some of the things were saying that some of the heart medications might affect you in terms of COVID-19. And Honestly, I'm not going to listen to any of that unless my cardiologist or my general practitioner contacts me and tells me to go off of certain medications. I'm going to continue taking my medications. I was off my medications for two years when I had my children. I then had a heart attack, so I know what happens when I don't take them, so I'm going to keep taking them. And um, healthy eating and staying active. I know this is hard. I usually go to the gym with my mom and um, now we can't go obviously, but there's some great ways to um, stay healthy because now if there's one golden lining in all of this is that there's lots of resources online and some of them are all sorts of exercises. So I've been trying out all sorts of things that I probably wouldn't have the courage to try in public like yoga or Zumba or something, but I can do in the comfort of my own home which sometimes can be a little stressful with toddlers, but it is what it is. And healthy eating, I am taking this time, um, I'm teaching my kids how to cook now that we have all of this ample time and we're eating healthy still, that's important. All of these things, we're trying to keep it as, you know, on schedule as what it was before the pandemic. But um, the other thing is you really self-care and listen to your body, do something for yourself. Uh, Colleen was saying she knits a lot now and that's one way of looking at it. You may have your religion or you may just wanna take a bath or maybe paint your toenails, do something, read a book that is for you and you yourself. And be kind to yourself. I mean, I know I'm not doing as great as what I would if I wasn't stuck in my hose. Like I know I've ate too many carbs, but I'm not going to get too stressed out about it. It's a new time. Nobody seems to know what's going on and everyone's just trying to survive. So I'm definitely in that too. And um, my husband works in the healthcare field. He uh, works as a pharmacist at a couple local hospitals. 
And it was a conversation we had to have. I technically work at the hospital too, but I decided to stay at home because we just couldn't afford to have two healthcare workers uh, with two little ones in, in case we did have to self-isolate. Knowing that I'm at higher risk, um, my husband has already said that he will self-isolate if he feels the, the need to at the time. So I think it's important to have a plan, not just a plan if you have to self-isolate, but what it looks like if you do think you're having a heart attack or a stroke. Myself, I have all of my contact information of all of my medical information on my phone so that if something did happen they would be able to access that um, mm -hmm. my parents live next door um, thank goodness so I know that they would be able to take the children if the emergency arose and if my husband would not be around and stay connected with your support team heart and stroke has the um, the community of survivors and there's also different women's groups out there and they're really great because if you don't have that kind of contact it's really nice to know that you have a whole community around you of people that know exactly what you're going through and sometimes it's just nice to go on and see something kind of funny and just kind of brighten up your day from them too and I think that's really important and your friends and your family thank goodness for FaceTime because you can reach out to anybody now really and the other thing is to stay aware. I'm always aware of the numbers and what's going on. I don't over dwell on it, but I definitely keep myself informed because I think that's important. But remember that you should always use reliable websites, Heart and Stroke for one, Ottawa Heart Health Institute. These are places that would probably be very um, reliable places to go. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. And we're always honest with our children about the possibility of self-isolation that my husband might have to leave. Again, we don't dwell on it. We're not even sure if they really understand it, but we just want to let them know that it might happen. And don't be scared to ask for help. If you are alone and you have little ones, or if you have uh, mobility issues, ask your neighbor or ask your friend, reach out to a family member and ask them for help, even if it's just to pick up a loaf of bread or something. I think that's really important as well. And the other thing is, is with children, I know it's really frustrating for them and it's frustrating for us and everyone seems to be in the same boat. And um, with us, the tips I would use um, on my children to talk to them about it would be honesty. We've always been honest with them. We tell them what's going on. We explain everything. Um, and we share new information as we see it. And also we don't make a big deal of it. We just kind of tell them what they need to know and go along our way. We don't want to cause them fear if they don't need it. And Heart and Stroke has some great resources too. Uh, Heart Smart Kids and the Canadian Association of Mental Health. There's so many resources online on ways to talk to your children. My kids are toddlers, so we don't really go in as depth probably mm -hmm. as what you would with a teenager, but there's all mm -hmm. sorts of tricks and things. And I think it's good to take this time to teach kids about healthy living, uh, washing hands, good hand hygiene is a good start, kind of knowing to, you know, kind of watch yourself when you go out in public and don't touch everything you see and teach them how to be healthy eating. They cook with me, like I said, we exercise together. We kind of do everything together and we acknowledge their feelings. Sometimes they get frustrated. My daughter said, can't we just go for a drive? She's three years old. And I just said, no, I'm sorry. Like we have to keep everybody safe. So that's no longer a thing here. But like I said, um, there are a lot of resources. I know myself, I go on the Canadian women's um, Facebook group and that's been a great help. And I go online, I use the Heart and Stroke website a lot for it. And I reach out to my friends and my family and those are my big support groups. Thanks, Nicole. I really appreciate your perspective. Um, for those of you participating who have questions for Nicole, we'll be taking questions for all three of our presenters at the end of the webinar. So moving on to our next speaker, um, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Colleen Norris. Colleen is a scientific director of the Cardiovascular Health and Stroke Strategic Clinical Network at the University of Alberta, and she's also a member of Heart and Stroke's Women's Research Steering Committee, among many other things. So now I will turn it over to you, Colleen. 
Thank you so much, Christian. Uh, it's so exciting to be part of this. And I have to say good morning from Alberta. It's not afternoon yet here. So um, as my disclosures say, I have no relationship with any commercial entity. We have to start every conference uh, session with that. So um, I wanted to talk a bit of, of, about how the coronavirus actually hijacks your cells. So it's uh, just to get, put us all on the same playing field. It's a crown, it's a coronavirus is named after the crown lac spikes. And you can see a little picture of it there that produced from the surface of the coronavirus. And it's cover, covered with a bubble of oily lipid. And that falls apart with soap. Ergo why we all have, should be washing our hands lost. The virus gets into your body through your nose, mouth or eyes. And then it attaches to the cells in your airway um, that make a protein called the ACE2. And the virus infects the cells by joining its oily membrane with the membrane of the cell and release snippets of genetic material called RNA. The infected cell then reads the RNA and starts to make a protein that will keep the immune system at bay, if you can imagine, it's smart enough to do that, and makes new copies of the virus, and it's millions of copies. Next slide, please. So each infected cell can release millions of copies of the virus before the cell breaks down and dies. And it affects the nearby cells, which are sitting in your airway and your lungs, and can end up in droplets that come out of your lungs when you cough or sneeze. So it expels the virus um, in, to nearby people and surfaces where it can remain infectious for several hours to days. Next slide, please. So our immune response is what is mounted as soon as the COVID comes into our system. And it starts usually, um, you know that the immune response is started when you get a fever and it's fighting to clear the virus. And see, I just touched my face and you're not supposed to be touching your face. Um, in severe cases, the immune system can overreact and it actually starts attacking the lung cells as well. And the lungs become extracted with fluid and all these dying cells and it makes it really difficult to breathe. So shortness of breath is one of the signs, um, chief symptoms and signs that you would be in trouble with COVID and coughing and sneezing. And it can lead to acute respiratory distress sy syndrome, um, which is why people end up in the ICU. Next slide, please. So obviously the best way to avoid coronavirus, it's just public health announcement, is to wash your hands lots, to avoid touching your face, keep your distance from people, and it's a hockey stick. And I've actually seen people walking around in Edmonton um, with a hockey stick because Although we're all self-isolating, we are also um, trying to keep healthy and fit. So you can walk outside um, if the weather permits it. And um, it's interesting to see people walking around with a hockey stick. And I'm, I'm waiting for someone to stick it up and say, stay back. That's how far you should be. And you need to regularly clean the frequently used surfaces. Next slide, please. So um, I'm talking about sex and gender differences with the coronavirus and particularly in women with cardiovascular disease. And I just wanted to explain that when we talk about sex um, in the science world, we're talking about a biological construct and it's male or female. And it's talking about the hormones and the genes and your anatomy and physiology. It does affect the propensity or the prevalence or the treatment of health conditions and diseases. And it means that we have differences in drug absorption, body composition, metabolism, diseases, and it's according to sex. And it's only been fairly recently that we're starting to identify that this ha we, had, we don't know what medications necessarily work with women because most of the studies have been done in men. Next slide, please. In contrast, gender is a social construct. Um, developed by social science uh, scientists, and it's how you define yourself as either a woman or a man. It is linked to power and economic and social status, and it's culturally specific. And unfortunately, um, for women or females, uh, males are valued over females globally. It's very distinct from sex, and it has a number of dimensions. And these dimensions have divided into uh, just for us to start to understand what gender actually means, your gender roles, your gender identity, your gender relations, and a thing called institutionalized gender. Next slide, please. 
So the good news on sex differences um, revolve around the immune system. So Dr. Sarah Klein, who's a professor of molecular microbiology and immunolo immunology at John Hopkins, has been talking about this for a while, and so much so that she's now called an immunofeminist. And she has identified that there are differences in the male and female immune system. So immune cells from females are more reactive and generate a more robust response. The X chromosome, which is encoded with more genes that control the immune function. And women, females, have two times more, uh, two X chromosomes versus the men with uh, X and Y. So we actually can mount a stronger immune response. The process is called hormone signaling and it's different from men, and estrogen is actually responsible for altering the signaling inside the immune cell, and it coaxes a cell to either start or halt, making a protein in an inflammatory response when it's repairing the tissues. Next slide, please. So the benefits for women sometimes having an overactive immune response is that when it comes to things like infection, we often fight it better. And actually, we're starting to see that in the COVID response. So a recent meta-analysis just done detected an increased severity and mortality rate in the male population with COVID-19. And it might be attributable to the sex-based differences in the cellular composition. And I know it sounds like a lot of science jar jargon, the last sentence that I've included here, but the thing I was trying to uh, highlight is that even today, this journal has put out the host cell receptor, ACE2 is likely regulated, et cetera, et cetera, but it's saying it might be a potential target for prevention and treatment for SARS-CoV-2 infections in men. So even at this stage, we're starting to say this might work for men, but we aren't looking at it working for women or necessarily paying attention to that. Next slide, please. So this is um, uh, one of the first slides that have come out that have identified that, as you can see in the top um, section of this, this is males and females. Males are on the left and females are on the right. In the cases of COVID that are happening, and you can see they're pretty equal in most of the age groups. But the bottom part of the slide is the deaths that are occurring. And as you can see, there's more deaths occurring in males at this point, um, as far as this study was concerned. And, and I think that's what we're seeing worldwide. Next slide, please. So um, the gendered related factors that I mentioned were um, these things that we call have identified through the Women's Health Research Network in these four areas. So gender roles include things like work situation and household and earner and childcare responsibility. Gender identity is your personality, your traits, your stress level. Institutionalized gender is things like personal income and level of education and your job value and your social standing. And gender relations are the emotional support or civil status that you have. And, and you can see at the bottom of this slide, we have a little going forward. So if you can do the next slide, please. This is, um, I'm just um, self-promoting here because we have an international consortium um, uh, with Dr. Luis Pilot out of McGill and Valeria Raffarelli from Rome and myself. And, um, uh, in, and as I mentioned, an international consortium that actually is looking at the effect of gender as opposed to sex and its effect on health outcomes. And it's called Going Forward and it's spelled like it is in the middle of the slide. And so if anybody's interested, we have a website, but we are actively looking at this to try and identify what gender variables are actually responsible for some of the outcomes, and even in the COVID environment. Next slide, please. So the um, gender-related differences that have been, um, are, are starting to be identified is that gender influ influences both the pattern of exposure, so women are more likely to stay home to infectious agents and the treatment of those infectious diseases. And gender roles actually influence where men and women are spending their time and the infections agents they come into contact with, as well as the nature of exposure and its frequency. So there are also differences in the provision of healthcare to males and females, as um, many women with heart disease would know, um, as well as the accumulated scientific knowledge about what the treatments work and how it influences the course of the disease. So we're starting to try and look at these in specifically as far as COVID is concerned. Next slide, please. 
Interestingly, um, for many women, and particularly those with children and elders at home, the coronavirus pandemic has given new urgency to many of the challenges that they've long been confronting. And some interesting statistics in relation to COVID and gender is that women comprise nearly half of the US workforce, but 70% of mothers with children under 18 are in the labor force. The median earnings for women are 81% of men's earning. And why that matter is because low income women who work part time are less likely to also have work benefits, including sick leave. And that's proving to be quite, uh, quite dramatic uh, have it quite a dramatic effect, particularly in the United States, because if they don't have sick leave, they're going into work and they may have COVID, um, but they can't afford not to go into work. And um, it's the progression of the disease is uh, demonstrating that that's what's happening. Women are likely to be the primary caregivers in most household women are managers of their family health needs. And this includes children and parents because we're sitting in the sandwich generation. Next slide, please. So the acute nature of the impact of coronavirus are that women are balancing multiple responsibilities. They don't have a safety net. They're suffering from lack of short and long-term care and support, and they're experiencing increased levels of stress and anxiety. Next slide, please. Interestingly, the Kaiser Family Foundation um, has already done surveys looking at this and have identified some of the interesting things that we should be paying attention to as we're uh, following up on the disease, this disease and its progress, that women are more likely than men to worry about the negative consequences of coronavirus. So they are, uh, they're more likely to worry that someone in their family will get sick, um, their investments will be affected, they'll lose income due to a workplace closure. They will not be able to afford testing in the States uh, or treatment for coronavirus if they need it, and they will put themselves at risk of exposure to coronavirus because they can't afford to stay home and miss work. So these are things that we know are different between men and women. Next slide, please. Their survey also identified this difference between sex and gender, because here we're saying women with children and women without children and comparing them to men with children and men without children. And you'll see that the women with children are actually the ones who are um, more worrying the most about loss and missing work due to coronavirus. So these are gendered factors that are playing, um, playing uh, in, in play here. So women with children more, uh, thinking more that they were worried about losing their income, that they'll put themselves at risk to exposure because they have to go to work and they'll not be able to afford the testing. Next slide, please. Some good news that might be related to uh, women being caregivers is that more women report that they've taken coronavirus um, precautions. So they've decided not to travel or they've canceled plans. Uh, importantly, they've stocked up on items as food and household supplies and treatment or medications. And I say that's important because they're able to stay home and, because they've already planned ahead. And they are now staying home instead of going to work because it ends up that they're the ones that have to care for the kids at home as well. So next slide, please. This is one of the most important slides of the Kaiser information is that more women report feeling negative mental health effects from worry about coronavirus. So um, the net negative impact is 30%, 36% of women are reporting feeling negative mental health effects, which means, next slide please, that stress management is more important than ever. And self-care is important as Nicole said, to manage your stress and anxiety, you need to keep up with friends and family by phone or online. Social distancing is not the same as social isolation. You need to make time to exercise and clear your head. Try to maintain your hobbies, um, participate in spiritual activities. If you're feeling sad or overwhelmed, you need to talk to your healthcare provider. Next slide, please really important to continue to maintain healthy habits while staying safe. So even though your routine is disrupted, it's more important than ever to eat healthy, stay active, get enough sleep and try and manage stress at home. And staying at home means making sure to take frequent, frequent breaks. And like Nicole said, try new exercise. There's everything is moving to the online environment. 
But most importantly, and this was in a discussion, I can't take credit for it, this, but it's really an important point, is that you need to lean into the what ifs, whether it's COVID or heart disease, as Nicole mentioned, you need to make a plan for what if you had coronavirus or that you started showing signs and symptoms of it and make that plan ahead of time so that you know who's going to take care of the kids and who's going to uh, perform all the roles that you are typically performing at home. Next slide, please. The other important thing that uh, has come out of this is that we need to continue seeing red with or without COVID-19. And you can see on the left that I've listed the symptoms of COVID-19, which we know are uh, indicative that you may have it, temperature, cough, headache, shortness of breath, chest discomfort, increased sweating, fatigue, and flu-like symptoms. But I've also noted the symptoms of a heart event in women, and some of them are less uh, common than people recognize but they also include chest discomfort, headache, fatigue, shortness of breath, flu-like symptoms, increased sweating and nausea. So either one or the other, if you're experiencing either symptoms one way or the other. Um, next slide, please. We need to make sure that women with CDD in the COVID um, now more than ever, you need to advocate for your own heart health or for other women's heart health. If you or anyone you love has symptoms of a heart attack or stroke, you need to call 911 immediately or call and call your health care provider if you develop chest discomfort, shortness of breath, or cardiac symptoms. Or if you have any symptoms of a heart attack or stroke, it's important to get to the hospital right away. And the most interesting thing that we're seeing in the data is that we are seeing less people with heart events or stroke um, stroke events um, coming to the hospital. And we're really, really concerned about that because um, there's a couple of ideas around that. One is that maybe that there's no exertion, there's less exertion going on because you're at home so that, that there's maybe less heart events occurring. But the other thing is that I think um, people are afraid to go to hospital because of COVID. And I can guarantee you that you will be absolutely protected at a hospital and that if you are experiencing any of these symptoms, you need to go to an emergency department. Um, that's the strongest message we can get out there right now to anyone that you know and love. Thank you very much. Thanks, Colleen. That was an incredible consolidation of information. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions for you at the end. So thank you very much for your, your presentation. Um, I'm very pleased next to introduce Dr. Talia Field. <clears throat> Talia is a stroke neurologist with the Vancouver Stroke Program in British Columbia, and she's a researcher funded through Heart and Stroke Humans Research Initiative. So now I will hand it over to you, Dr. Field. Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, so I guess I'm kind of uh, bringing this together from a clinical perspective. You heard about the personal side of things from Nicole. Uh, Dr. Norris talked about the scientific aspects from a physiological and epidemiological and sociological perspective. And um, I'm just going to give you a bit of an insider's view of kind of what the systemic implications have been that have impacted uh, the way you navigate your clinical care within the system. Um, so we'll go ahead. These are my disclosures, uh, none of which are related to the content we're discussing today. Next slide. So um, as, as Dr. Norris said, at the best of times, uh, women face issues related to their cerebrovascular and their cardiovascular health through uh, challenges related to sex, uh, biological aspects, as well as gender, those social aspects. And these challenges modulate uh, depending where you are uh, at phases of your life. Um, but one thing that is common is that we have to navigate some of these differences uh, from a perspective where uh, a little more advocacy for oneself may be needed to seek the best possible clinical care. I'll go to the next slide. So 
So when I think about the continuum of stroke care, it starts at the beginning, and, and this is also relatable, I think, to cardiac care as well. You have your acute event, it's recognized, it's diagnosed, it's worked up. Uh, you're either admitted or managed in the outpatient environment. There are investigations, there are medications to related to things not happening again. Uh, there's inpatient or outpatient rehabilitation at times, and then there is your life after your event. And so, COVID has affected the way uh, the system is handling some of these things. And, and this pre presents added challenges, I think, for patients and the people that uh, care and advocate for them. How things affected recognition. So there's been a big uh, emphasis on social distancing and staying home when necessary. Um, but as we've been saying over and over again, an emergency is an emergency. What we are finding is that people are definitely more hesitant to seek the acute care for symptoms of stroke or heart attack or cardiac arrest than they normally would because they're afraid of getting infected in the hospital. Our volumes are way down. I have been on call for three of the last six weeks for the stroke service. We are usually one of the busiest services in the hospital and we're all saying to ourselves, where are all the people? It's possible that in part, yes, maybe uh, decreased physical activity, different types of stress may be associated with maybe lower rates in, in some cases of events, but overall our suspicion, and, and this is the same thing going on worldwide reported by our colleagues in different countries, is that the numbers are much lower than we would expect because people seem to be staying home wondering if not seeking presentation for their symptoms is a less risky thing than possibility than the possibility of getting infected with COVID-19 if they go to the hospital. Let me reassure you that there are precautions in place to protect patients, to separate people with COVID-related symptoms from not. We have capacity for you in the hospital and you need to seek attention for these emergent symptoms because it's associated with better outcomes when you get treated faster. Um, other things that have affected the way that we're able to handle uh, queries related to acute systems is uh, things like overwhelming the uh, nurse's advice line for the health link. Uh, initially, when people were concerned about COVID symptoms, a lot of people were calling 811, and because of these increased volumes, people couldn't get through for the normal questions they normally had about whether or not they should seek medical attention for symptoms of stroke or heart attack. Things are changing rapidly. Uh, people are learning to recalibrate the health systems in order to accommodate these increased volumes of calls. There are now online symptom checkers for things like COVID to offload some of that demand. Um, but it has affected, I think, the way that people may be considering the risk benefit uh, aspect of seeking help for their system, uh, for, for their symptoms. Additionally, um, you know, as physicians, we've had to recalibrate the way that we practice very quickly. And you may have found that some of your initial routine follow-up appointments with your physicians were canceled uh, or rescheduled in order for your, for your physician's offices to accommodate the different ways in which we had to interact with patients in order to accommodate social distancing. Um, another way that acute care has been affected is just the number of precautions taken as we do these careful infection control uh, uh, considerations when we're seeing patients in the acute setting. Uh, we will consider that anybody coming in uh, from uh, the community may be a potential case of COVID. And as we take those added precautions with personal protective equipment for ourselves, for the patients, sterilizing uh, areas where people have been, uh, that can affect the speed at which people are treated as well. So you have kind of delays in seeking treatment compounded by slightly longer treatment times within the hospital. Um, so in order to uh, kind of bridge that gap, part of the things that uh, you need to do are to seek immediate treatment for yourself or for your loved ones if those symptoms occur. Okay, next slide. So other challenges related to COVID that you see when you're actually in the hospital are related to some of these infection control measures. And, and we're all trying to work around things, but uh, that's, that's a picture of me uh, dressed like a scuba diver uh, off to see patients in the emergency room. And you can imagine that it is a little bit difficult to not just pick up on social cues and build a therapeutic relationship with your physician when you're communicating through this mask, but also just very basic things like hearing me properly, 
seeing my lips move if you're hard of hearing, trying to absorb information at a stressful time when people are in these uh, costumes that are always reminding you of what's going on. You know, having a stroke or a heart attack is stressful enough and trying to take it in an environment where there are all these other cues that there are other problems going on can affect the way that you're absorbing information. So uh, it's something to keep in mind that you may be needing to ask people to repeat themselves, to write things down, to clarify afterwards if you didn't get things, to get your family members to call in and ask your physicians questions if something is not clear. Um, and uh, again, this is sometimes modifying the way that we have to interact with our patients. Uh, things like using stethoscopes is something that uh, is not uh, being done that routinely because there's an added step of sterilization for equipment that may be shared between patients. And we've also had to modify the way we do physical exams on people in the hospital. So all of these things kind of uh, impact the clinical care that we're able to provide. And uh, for that reason, you need to speak up if you have an added concern if you need to be re-examined in some way that you think uh, may have been overlooked. Uh, I think there's an added level of advocacy that's needed at a time like this. Next slide. So some of these uh, reallocations and reorganizations related to healthcare resources uh, have also impacted the way that we have to investigate uh, certain symptoms and work up causes of stroke and other things like that. For example, um, trans uh, esophageal echocardiograms, ultrasounds of the heart that we do where we actually put a probe down uh, the esophagus as it's close to the heart to get a better look. Because of concerns about generating droplets, a lot of those procedures have been cancelled or deferred. Um, other things like uh, Holter monitors, uh, because of the added step of sterilization for uh, these 24-hour heart rhythm monitors, there may be an added aspect of delay as well. Um, and it's important to point out that if your tests have been deferred or canceled or rescheduled, it's an added thing there. You need to keep track of things and you cannot be under the assumption that uh, these things will be automatically rescheduled for you. Uh, again, as, as we've mentioned, there may be shortages or limitations on medication dispensing. And uh, because people are staying home, there are also higher demands on delivery services uh, for things like medications and food. So that's another thing to be considered. Um, and again, some of your uh, medical follow-up appointments may be uh, delayed and rescheduled uh, from your physician side. But as a physician, I'm also seeing that some of my patients are delaying or rescheduling appointments because they're concerned about being effect infected. So uh, I think one thing you need to um, put to your physician is, you know, is this something that we can do remotely? If there was no capability of doing things remotely before, you know, things change very quickly. Uh, things may have changed in the last two weeks and you're physician may have capabilities now that uh, uh, weren't available two weeks ago. Um, rehabilitation has been uh, impacted. Uh, outpatient uh, rehabilitation things that happen in groups, therapists visiting your homes, all of these normal services has, have been interrupted. And again, we're catching up, we're learning how to deliver things remotely, but those things take time for reorganization and you need to check. Something that someone told you might not uh, be able to happen two weeks ago may have changed now. We're also seeing that our inpatient rehabilitation may have been reorganized as well. For example, at my center, um, the palliative care because of infection precautions has been moved to uh, our normal inpatient rehabilitation hospital. So that may be affecting things from a systemic perspective as well. Um, moving on. And then of course, uh, there is returning to your life after stroke or a cardiac event, which uh, as you know, is a challenge to navigate at the best of times. Uh, your normal support groups, your normal social activities, your leisure activities, your transportation have been disrupted. Uh, there may be amplified demands as we've talked about before with household roles. Uh, all of a sudden, not are, are you just worrying about returning to work, you're also homeschooling, or you may be worrying not just about delivering care uh, and uh, supplies for your own household, you may be worrying about your elderly parents or other relatives uh, and so forth. Um, Again, you are doing ninja work trying to access your outpatient care for medical follow-ups and rescheduling and figuring out how to use the internet for appointments. Uh, you may be trying to figure out how you are dealing with more frequent refills. 
Um, this is one of my very favorite cartoons, just I think demonstrating some of the constant uh, chatter that you know needs to go on in your head in order to maintain normal day-to-day -day life. And these were these things were already challenging enough before COVID. Thank you very much. Um, so again, just to reiterate some of my personal tips for women with lived experience and those who care for them as to how to navigate the system. So again, an emergency is always an emergency. And the faster you seek treatment for stroke symptoms or cardiac symptoms, the greater your likelihood is of a good outcome. We have precautions in place in the hospital and with paramedics to minimize risk of infection. And uh, if you're concerned about whether or not this is an appropriate use of the healthcare system, this is why you pay your tax dollars. This is a very appropriate use of the healthcare system to seek treatment or assessment for possible symptoms of deadly and disabling conditions. Um, as we've mentioned, you know, some people may have their COVID goggles on as healthcare workers when they're assessing you. And I don't just mean those physical goggles, I mean your mental goggles too, in terms of the lens with which you may be viewing symptoms. Um, if you don't feel you have the correct diagnosis or you've been sent home saying come back if your symptoms get worse, you need to advocate for yourself, you need to present again, or you need to say I'm not sure if this is kind of the entire picture, I'm really concerned, I've never had symptoms like this before, I don't feel like I have infection, uh, could this be something else? And this draws us towards, um, again, being aware of those signs of stroke or signs of heart attack. Uh, the commonest symptoms we think of stroke are motor uh, changes related to your face, your arms or legs, changes affecting your speech, whether that's finding words or uh, getting the right words out, uh, saying them properly, and that time sensitivity because faster treatment leads to better outcomes. Signs of heart attack, which can include but are not limited to chest discomfort, sweating, upper body discomfort, nausea, shortness of breath, and lightheadedness. So again, uh, you need to advocate for yourself at the best of times, and part of that is being organized. You need to be familiar with medical history, the investigations that you've had and their results, both those that have been done and those that may be pending or need to be rescheduled, and to know the medications that you're on. It's always good to have these in writing and to have on hand, and it's always good to have extra copies. Sometimes, you know, patients will hand you a list in the emergency room and it may get lost, so you want to make sure that that's not your only list. Again, as nice as it would be for all of these appointments to be automatically rescheduled, you cannot take that for granted and you need to follow up and ask and keep track for yourself. If you don't have uh, copies of your investigation results, your physician can provide that for you. So you need to be able to ask. Um, again, you know, it is a time where a lot of people are overwhelmed, both on the patient side and on the physician side. And if someone has not communicated something to you about your healthcare plan in a way that uh, uh, is crystal clear, you need to clarify don't be afraid to ask again. Don't be afraid to ask for it in writing. Don't be afraid to ask if your friend can call uh, and speak to them just to make sure that you've heard everything correctly. And the other thing, again, related to the supply chain with your medications is that you are going to need to be refilling faster. I have had patients that have been concerned about the added inconvenience or challenge uh, in uh, kind of getting refills. Don't be afraid to do this. This is what your physicians and your pharmacists are for. You need to anticipate when your medications may run out. And in some cases, uh, because of supply chain issues, your typical medications may not necessarily be available. So it's always good to plan in advance to speak to your physician about what some possible alternatives may be, either because of supply issues or because of affordability issues if your uh, coverage or normal income streams have been disrupted because of changes in your work. Next slide. So again, uh, like I've mentioned, from a healthcare perspective, we are all getting used to these uh, adjustments very quickly. Um, I think that uh, the system has been very reactive. Things that we never thought were going to be delivered virtually or things that we thought would need years of infrastructure in place before uh, changes were made are suddenly happening very quickly. Um, and again, like I've been saying, something that wasn't available to you two weeks ago may be available now. Um, so appointments with your doctor may have changed. Uh, things that may have been canceled may now be available by phone or video conference. 
sometimes phone appointments are great, but if you're hard of hearing or you need to lip read or there are other aspects that make the way that you absorb uh, spoken information uh, a challenge for you, you should find out in advance whether or not this is going to be a phone or a video conference uh, appointment. Can you have someone else listening in on the line or should they call your loved one uh, afterwards to reiterate some of the information, get additional uh, information, uh, kind of clarify that plan? Um, and if your appointment has been uh, canceled, to make sure that it gets rescheduled. There are suddenly, I mean, there were uh, resources available before related to rehabilitation and therapy online, but I think uh, the availability of these and our knowledge uh, and awareness of these uh, programs has exploded. If you're not aware, I suggest that you look on some of the survivors groups in order to trade trips, uh, tips with one another about available services. Uh, some of these services are paid, some of them are free of charge, um, and it's good to do your research. And again, things are changing rapidly and new things may be available now. Um, and again, ask proactively, advocate for yourself, keep track of what is missing in your care or what needs to continue and make sure that that is followed up on. Um, and, and I think that there is a silver lining to all of this in that, you know, it has always been harder for women to access care because of their social roles, uh, because the fact that women may be likelier to live alone at the time that they have their stroke or heart attack and may need to access resources without someone able to drive them, or women may be working or caring for young children and needing to uh, try to coordinate their rehabilitation appointments with the rest of their lives. I think the infrastructure related to virtual care, virtual rehabilitation, virtual support is now exploding. And I don't think that those things are going to go away. I think in the end, there will be added benefits in helping women access the care they need. So I think there is a silver lining to all of this. Next slide. So, um, We've talked already about uh, uh, being aware of healthy behaviors uh, when you're at home, some of the challenges related to eating well and exercising. But, you know, I urge you to not let uh, perfect be the enemy of good. And by that, I mean, you know, there's never going to be a right time. Do those things that you can do, whether they're small, whether they're not as good as they would normally be. Uh, any actions you take are better than none. And I think it also continues that schedule of paying attention to yourself and paying attention to your own wellness. Um, we know that uh, women who have made uh, health-related changes uh, to their lifestyle are at lower risk of stroke and heart attack over time, both related to their physical activity, uh, related to smoking sensation, and related to diet. So again, even those small steps continue the pathway of uh, making a big difference over time. So again, just to reiterate my main points, uh, we all know that the current healthcare environment and uh, systemic changes add added challenges to navigating your care. So you need to be prepared and organized and advocate for yourself. Um, again, the system is adapting quickly and you need to keep checking to see if resources that were not previously available to you are available now. Um, and again, uh, any attention you can pay towards your own wellness is good. And please, please, please access emergent care in emergencies. That is what we are here for. Thank you, okay. Dr. Field. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I think that we all agree, um, and the literature says this too, that women so often put themselves last. So I really appreciate your final message and, and that everyone reiterated about not delaying and accessing that emergent care if it is an emergency. Um, I think we have some time for a few short questions. I wanted to highlight very quickly that there are a number of resources that we recommend people check out. If you are interested in some more support resources, you can look at the Canadian Partnership for Stroke Recovery. Uh, Heart and Stroke also has a number of resources, including how to talk to your doctor and how to advocate for yourself. And finally, specific to COVID-19, heartandstroke.ca has a number of really fantastic resources. So please go check out our website. I'm now going to hand it over to Catherine Rand, who is going to field a few questions for uh, our presenters. Katie, are you there? I am. Thank you, Kristen. 
Uh, so we'll jump right in. We've already got some great questions. So perhaps we'll start with uh, uh, Dr. Norris. The question is, I self-isolate, live alone, and no one enters my home. Is disinfecting sur surfaces needed? And a second part of the question is, can I accept help for spring cleaning? And if so, should this person wear a mask? Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I think the cleaning surfaces is always important. Uh, we, we have no idea how the virus, well, we know how the virus is traveling, but I, I don't think it hurts ever to clean the surfaces that you have, even though you're living alone. Um, the, the second question is uh, about the person coming into your home, and I would absolutely suggest yes, um, and that they wear a mask and you keep your you keep your distance from them. I'm I'm hesitating. Maybe Thalia has some other advice on this. I'm just I'm concerned about saying where that person has been. If that if they're just coming in to clean your home, then I think you'd be safe if they wore a mask. But I don't know, Thalia. What do you think? I mean, I think you just uh, need to consider that uh, people may uh, have, uh, I, I think you need to take precautions in considering that even if you don't have symptoms, uh, someone may possibly have COVID. Uh, it's good to uh, make sure that someone is protected and it's good to make sure that uh, any high touch surfaces uh, are, are uh, considered if uh, someone else has been touching them that they're cleaned afterwards. Um, you know, that being said, the virus does not live on surfaces forever. Um, and I think, you know, it's, uh, it's reasonable after you've taken a couple of hours to clean those high touch surfaces. But if you need help, you should be accepting it. Thank you both very much. Uh, next question, I'm going to maybe start with Nicole and then open it up for the other panelists uh, for any other comments. So the question is really around anxiety um, being frequent with a health scare and sometimes the time in between appointments can be really challenging for people. And unfortunately, during COVID-19, many routine appointments um, may be rescheduled or canceled and, and set at a later date. So uh, any advice, Nicole, that you have for someone waiting on follow-ups with healthcare professionals and, and dealing with this specific type of anxiety? I think you're muted, Nicole. Sorry. I've actually thought a lot about this because it is a really scary time. And when you're first coming home from the hospital, especially that time between coming home, cardiac rehab and your other um, appointments is a terrifying time. I wish I had like a an answer for that. I think though um, knowledge helps a lot. If you go and check out some of the resources on heart and stroke, you reach out to the community of survival mm -hmm. groups. It's really good to have that peer support because a lot of times people are kind of going through the same thing. They know what you're going through through and I think the big thing is if there's something you're very concerned about uh, contact your health care provider but definitely don't feel afraid to talk and reach out to people for that and the online services are great for that and there's actually some virtual cardiac rehabs now going on too. Great thanks Nicole any other comments uh, Dr. Fields or Dr. Norris to add to that? I, I would add that, you know, don't be afraid if you have a question that you need clarified for your with your physician to contact their office. I mean, the worst that happens is that they're busy and they'll get back to you in a while. But I mean, don't don't be afraid to ask. This is what they're here for. Um, and uh, often if it's a, a question that can be answered quickly with a phone call or an email or a discussion through your assistant, um, uh, all of these things are doable. So just because your appointment has been uh, canceled or deferred doesn't mean that you can't uh, get your questions answered. Great, thank you so much. And I know we're running out of time here. So perhaps um, just uh, one final question is, um, throughout the webinar, we spoke a lot about the importance of sex and gender, uh, specific to public health data collection and things, uh, especially in crises like this with COVID-19. Uh, so Dr. Norris, can you recommend any resources to the general public to learn more about sex and gender and what this means in research? So uh, thanks for the question. Actually, um, one of the things that our group has done um, in the COVID environment is we've uh, sent a letter to all the editors of the, mag of the journals to request that data be stratified at least by sex so we can start seeing this 
data coming out on COVID um, by sex and gender. There are great websites. Um, the uh, there's the Women's World Health Global Women's World Health website has all sorts of information on um, sex and gender. The Going Forward website would also so going um, forward is FWD. And Heart and Stroke has lots of information on sex and gender and the differences. And um, just even typing in sex and gender, you'll get lots of information uh, in Google Scholar, or Google Search. Great, thank you so much. So unfortunately, that concludes our webinar today. We want to thank everyone for the wonderful questions and apologize that we weren't able to get to them to uh, get to them all today. And we hope that you as webinar attendees left feeling connected across to across uh, we hope you feel connected to others across the country and that you've received some credible information from these experts today um, we also want to mention two upcoming webinars next week so on tuesday april 21st we will be hosting a webinar on sleep and vascular health and on friday april 24th we'll be hosting one on practical virtual rehabilitation and self-management techniques during covid19 for people living with heart conditions so you can find both of these webinars on our Stroke Best Practices website under our resource tab. And we hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your day and we look forward uh, to having you tune in again to our webinar next week. And thank you again to our wonderful speakers for taking the time and expertise today to share that with us. Thanks so much.